Tonight on Free Minds TV, we'll be talking about the DEA operating in foreign countries. We'll also be discussing the Ron Paul campaign and a New Hampshire court ruling that says you do have a right to videotape police officers, plus a little bit of discussion on the housing market. That coming up tonight on Free Minds TV. Welcome to a brand new edition of Free Minds TV, where we challenge you, the viewer, to think outside the box. With you, as always, is Toby. And Nick. We do have a jam-packed show for you tonight, where we're going to be getting into all sorts of stories, as well as a, a rant Nick has at the end of the show. Listen to him get all heated about something well, he feels passionate about. I don't know about. if you should make those promises. Sometimes my rants can be pretty boring. We'll see. We're gonna save, be around. We'll save that for the latter part of the show. But first, we have some other stories to be getting into. We're also going to be discussing a story from LouRockwell.com. We've talked about Ron Paul in the past. Yeah, um, but what would happen if he actually was elected president? Very unlikely. He's pretty much blacked out. Um, I think he's doing a little bit better than last time, but still the odds of him actually winning the nomination and winning the White House is still certainly an outside chance. Still would be interesting to... Think about what would happen if he was elected. We'll be getting into that as well as some really good news coming out of New Hampshire where we're broadcasting from about uh, recording police officers or uh, ruling there. But first, I want to get into a story that, well, it surprised me. It shouldn't surprise me. I should be very used to things by now. But I had absolutely no idea that the United States is operating all sorts of, um, has all sorts of essentially military troops in foreign countries not in the war zones necessarily, uh, but in commando style um, squads battling drug traffickers. Yes, I knew that we were doing some under the radar stuff with the CIA and stuff, and that's what was expected, but I had no idea that the DAA now has five commando style squads it has been quietly deploying for the past several years to Western Hemisphere nations, including Haiti, Honduras, the Dominican Republic, Guatemala, and Belize and are battling drug cartels. The program is called FAST, or Foreign Deployed Advisory Support Teams, and was, credited, uh, was created during the George W. Bush administration to investigate the Taliban-linked drug traffickers in Afghanistan. Beginning in 2008 and continuing under President Obama, it has expanded beyond the war zone. The evolution of the program into global enforcement arm reflects the United States' growing reach on combating drug cartels and how policymakers increasingly are blurring the line between law enforcement and military activities, fusing elements of the war on drugs with the war on terror. And this is coming from the New York Times, by the way. I'll post the show content up on our website, freemindstv.com, so you can read the full article. I'm just reading some of the highlights so you guys can get an idea of what's going on here. Federal law prohibits the drug agency from directly carrying out arrests overseas, but agents are permitted to accompany their foreign counterparts on operations. In certain circumstances, they may also open fire to protect themselves or partners. They do that from time to time. Uh, the deployment to Afghanistan has resulted in large seizure of drugs and some tragedy. Two of the DEA agents who died in the helipad he died in a helicopter crash in 2009 where the, um, um, and late, late last week an agent was shot in the head when his squad came under fire while leaving um, a compound where they had just seized all sorts of drugs. The commandos have been deployed to at least 15, at least 15 times to Latin America and the article goes on and on. I'm just, I had no idea this was happening. Uh, I guess I should have just figured it by now but they're essentially fighting little skirmishes all over the globe, Nick. Yeah, the war on drugs really is, I mean, it, it, in some of its more extreme applications, really is a war. We've talked plenty about what's going on in Mexico, where we're really not directly involved, although I think uh, one of the big stories that came out of the uh, Republican race so far is that Rick Perry said he thought that the U.S. military should be directly involved in the conflict in Mexico. So we've pointed out how there really is basically a shooting war taking place there, more on the scale of a civil war than what you would expect from um, you know, uncoordinated criminal activity in a normal society. And this is something that you know, the United States has been fighting the war on drugs both here in the U.S. and around the world, Toby, through sort of this combination of law enforcement techniques and military and intelligence agency type techniques. And unfortunately, not only are we seeing that 
kind of blending, as they're pointing out, between, say, the war on terror and military and intelligence operations, along with the war on drugs. Not only are we seeing that abroad, but we're also seeing, increasingly, police forces being militarized here in the U.S., you know, less respect being paid to due process. More and more, a lot of the aspects of the police state are directly tied in with the war on drugs, or at least that's the primary justification that's offered to say why we need militarized police forces and why we need to gut the Fourth Amendment and things like that. So the war on drugs has been very dangerous to our liberties here at home, and it's also resulted in the U.S. spending a lot of money overseas. It's another interesting aspect of this. They point out that uh, a lot of this has to be done because of the war on terror. Drug cartels oftentimes fuel terror cells, which then well, they, bad people attack America. Well, what's an, an amazing way to cut the money supply off of terrorist groups? Well, you get rid of their money by ending the war on drugs. See, when you make a certain product illegal and there's a black market, the prices skyrocket and people can make a whole lot of money off that pro product. Oftentimes very bad people, and that's exactly what's happening with this war on drugs. You end the war on drugs, the money dries up. You can easily do that. Um, yes, there would be consequences of that, but I, I don't think that they would be nearly as bad as the con unintended consequences uh, that come from the war on drugs. Another aspect that this article gets into here that is also interesting is one of the, the, the goals of these, these little DEA raids across the globe is to take out drug kingpins, the, the big guys, the big drug lords. Um, but what that also does is it creates a void that has to be filled. So then you get all these little skirmishes between the cartels. This is, really, you can, this is highlighted on the American-Mexican border where there's all sorts of cartels kidnapping people, battling people, fighting the police, fighting each other. Thousands, tens of thousands of people being killed because there isn't just one big old kingpin. So there's all sorts of unintended consequences when you're taking out one drug lord, another one has to seize power, they kill all these people in between to seize the power and fill the vacuum, fill the void. As long as the substance is illegal, there's going to be someone who's willing to fill that role. And the more you fight it, the higher the prices go up, the more the profit margins go up, the worse the kind of people you'll attract. Because if you're willing to be risking your life to sell this product, um, probably not the best kind of businessman. You're kind of a sketchy, bad person. Yeah, I mean, that's typically why you do see, I mean, certainly people, especially at higher levels who are involved in the drug trade, they're not nice people. They do use violence. That's why you see the cartels running a lot of the drug trade in Mexico. It, it's, it works in a similar way around the world. But that's one of the, you know, the consequences of prohibition, Toby, is that if the product is illegal, criminals are going to be the ones selling it. And the ones who really rise up to, you know, kingpin level or, you know, to running their own cartel are usually criminals who are willing to be worse, more aggressive than other criminals. So usually you get your, your real psychopaths and murderers at those higher levels in these, these uh, organizations that make their money from selling drugs. As long as there's enough money in it, people will stay involved. I mean, that's unfortunately, uh, people have not seen the logic that alcohol prohibition did not work. It resulted in gangsters selling liquor, resulted in a lot of other unintended consequences in American society. And ultimately, we said that alcohol prohibition, while it may have been well intentioned, simply did not work. It, it didn't make people's lives better, it didn't make society a safer place. The same thing's happening today with drug prohibition. Really, Alcohol prohibition was just a narrowly tailored drug prohibition because alcohol is a drug. It's just one drug in that case. Instead of the war on drugs, targets a wide range of them, although most of the resources are spent combating marijuana. But, I mean, they're combating a wide range of substances. Sure. And, you know, I think many drug warriors out there are very well-intentioned, um, except if you were really going to look at it objectively, you'd also see that the drug kingpins drug dealers are also for a war on drugs. Guess what? Drug dealers don't want the war on drugs to end because there goes all their money, their profit, their business. They're out of business if the war on drugs ends. So, I mean, I think it's time for an objective look at the war on drugs. Let's step back, society, and look at what's happening. Is it working? No. In fact, if you look at the raw data, it shows that the harder you fight the war on drugs, the more drugs come in, the more people use these illegal substances and oftentimes very harmful substances. 
suggest people check out Law Enforcement Against Prohibition at leap.cc. That's leap.cc. Check it out for yourself. I know we're just a couple of young whippersnappers on TV, and what do we know? Take it from the word of maybe some ex-police officers, some judges, some prosecutors, some ex-DEA agents who have seen what the war on drugs does and the unintended consequences of it. Do the research yourself and then come to your own conclusion. Is it worth all the unintended, un, unintended consequences to continue fighting this war? Does it really make sense? I think if you look at it objectively and take the emotional arguments out of it, you'll come to the same conclusion we have and say, no, it does not. It does far more harm to fight it than it would be to look at it from a safer standpoint. Right. I mean, harm reduction. I mean, the fact is that no matter where people are watching this, there are people probably within, you know, within your community, unless you're living out in the wilderness, within a mile or two of you, they're probably using illicit drugs right now. So the war on drugs certainly has not worked to stop drug use. And as you pointed out, Toby, there's a pretty strong case to be made that there's a positive correlation between uh, the ramping up that's taken place in the war on drugs over the past few decades and the amount of drug use in society and the harm resulting from that drug use. So drug use, certainly use of, of drugs that are currently illicit drugs, not a good thing. And some are more harmful than others. Certainly, I think uh, individual people, there are recreational drug users who don't really have a chemical dependency, don't have uh, a habit per se. There are a lot of people who do suffer from uh, substance abuse disorders. So there are a lot of people out there who are hooked on drugs. It does have a negative impact on people's lives. But it would make a lot more sense to address it as a health issue, just like we do with alcohol or nicotine addiction or caffeine addiction. I think you'd be far more effective if you actually addressed it from that angle. Sure. Not a lot of people don't do drugs because they're, they're illegal. They don't. Right. I mean, that's well, there are better reasons. Right. I mean, th there are more pressing reasons to n not use drugs, especially harder drugs like cocaine or heroin. It, the, whether or not they're illegal is not why people do or don't do them. If people are willing to look past the fact that they very well may kill you the, even the first time you use them, you very well may become addicted. You have to buy them from some very nasty people in most cases. If you're willing to look past all of those things, I think the fact that you might get arrested is pretty far down the list of, of the, act, the reasons why people decide to use a drug or not use a drug. Yeah. Is it Portugal that decriminalized drugs, say, 10 years ago? Uh, Portugal decriminalized, yeah. Portugal and what have they seen? Usage. They've seen a usage decline. Yeah. Fewer people using drugs since they More people seeking treatment as yeah. opposed to just putting them in jail, which is really a revolving door. You put them in prison, yeah. they get out. They don't have a job, they just get out of prison, so they don't really have that many yeah. contacts in their life. That yeah, many sure. people will fall back on, so usually they end up right back out on the street using drugs again. We could talk about this forever, Nick, uh, but well, I we've do. we've talked about it for about as long and as the show's have, been around. So. But we have more stuff to get into. I do, I just think it's important for, to keep on addressing it to maybe get that person out there that says, well, what are these two crazy people thinking about? Maybe they'll go and do the research themselves. Well, and the public opinion has been moving that way over yeah. the last few years, so... As Either we become less crazy or the rest of you are becoming a little bit more like us, one yeah. or the other. But. Well, one person who's just as crazy as us, I guess, is actually running for president. Um, Ron Paul would, is someone who would end the federal war on drugs. He believes that the harm it does is uh, the war on drugs, the unintended consequence of the war on drugs is far more harmful than the harm reduction treating it as a medical issue. We actually interviewed him. Um, back in 2008 when he was running and one of the things we talked about was harm reduction and the war on drugs and he said he would treat it as a medical issue not a criminal issue which I think is a very smart approach. What if he was president? Very unlikely Nick but what else besides ending the war, federal war on drugs would he cease and desist or change about well, the federal government? There's quite a few things and one of the reasons I like talking about this because some people might say well why do you, I, people might understand that Ron Paul is probably the politician that whose views ours would align with most, most closely, but why are we wasting time talking about what he would do as president because he's probably not going to win? Well, frankly, if we talked about any of the people who probably are going to win, we would just be talking about largely the status quo, arguing about a few details, but nothing much different than the Obama administration or the Bush administration. I don't think that those two administrations 
um, stand light years apart. I don't think they're at odds. But if you look at what Ron Paul would do as president, you're actually talking about something that would be fundamentally different than what mainstream politicians are asking. He would actually try to reduce the size of government and move government back towards its constitutional role. Now, he'd have some difficulties in doing that. He'd have to work with the Congress. Uh, you know, there's, there's a massive entrenched bureaucracy in place that you have to contend with. But he would at least try to move in that direction. So let's point out a few things that he would do if he actually won and was in the White House, which again, we don't think is likely, but it's, it's interesting to think about what he would do. Uh, President Paul would immediately push for a $1 trillion cut in federal spending. That's per year, not the current proposal, which I, they point out is like $3 trillion over 10 years. And that's actually not a spending cut because half of it comes from raising taxes. I don't know how raising taxes is a spending cut. Um, President Paul would have the authority as commander in chief to withdraw troops from overseas. They point out that there are a lot of treaties in place, Toby. So we wouldn't really be able to withdraw from nations where we have a treaty agreement because it's pretty long standing. You can't just bring the troops home? You can't just break a treaty. Not from, not from everywhere. There's a lot of places where there's no treaty in place that obligates us to stay. So he could pull so the troops out. What do you need to change those treaties to bring them home? Well, it's difficult to change it. Yeah, I guess you would or need to renegotiate. Or are we stuck there forever no matter what? Well, or, I mean, some of the treaties might last for a period of years, or we would need to renegotiate the treaties. But yeah, I mean, even if Ron Paul were elected president, some of the occupations, some of the military presences would continue. That's upsetting. It wouldn't be all magic and rainbows. So. Uh, president Paul would have some empty chairs in his cabinet. Uh, he would probably attempt to eliminate uh, the Department of Commerce, Department of Education, and other cabinet positions, things which you really don't need in the federal government. I don't know when the federal government decided that they needed to run education in the United States. I don't know where in the Constitution it says the federal government can do that. State governments, most people would agree, most constitutional scholars would agree, have that purview. The feds, they just got involved in it. Like they got involved with healthcare and they got involved with a bunch of other things that they have no legitimate authority to do. So Ron Paul's pretty big on limiting the federal government to explicitly what it's permitted to do in the Constitution. They also point out that the Federal Reserve, one of the biggest things, auditing the Fed, obviously Ron Paul would like to do away with it. He wouldn't really have the authority to do that as president, but he'd be in a pretty good position to push for an audit. And they point out here, they, they actually point out something that JFK did. Um, you know, Ron Paul's politics are quite a bit different than JFK's in many respects, but one area where they line up uh, is that you probably don't know that the Federal Reserve Bank takes a 6% cut off the top of all interest rates it collects as middleman between the U.S. Treasury Department and local banks. JFK realized that, recognized that it would contribute to federal deficits, which are here, massive federal deficits. Um, and he cut the Federal Reserve out of the equation back in 1963 by directly issuing U.S. notes, not Federal Reserve notes, into the economy. Now, and he was assassinated, so that sure. put an end to that. But. And real quick for people who aren't familiar, the Federal Reserve, this is a myth. I was on one of those 14 myths or something. Um, I was on a blog that was 14 myths about the U.S. government that most people don't know about. One of them was that the Federal, uh, the federal Reserve is not actually a part of the U.S. government. It's a... It's a private organization that just, just takes our money. It is a private organization. Right, but most people don't know that. Most people think the, the Federal Reserve is the Fed, yeah. part of the federal government. Yeah, they think it's part of that. It used to be that the Treasury Department was in charge of issuing the nation's currency. They still make coins like pocket change and commemorative pieces. Some of them are very nice. I, I like, collect them. I like some of the U.S. Treasury's work. They were actually supposed to be the ones who were in charge of regulating the value of the currency, not some group of central bankers. Yeah, it's a we private got sold bank. Out. Yeah, it's we, a private bank that controls well, all Well, there's it. supposedly some oversight mechanism. Supposedly, but, but we yeah. can't audit it, so how do we know? Right. It's a secret central bank that controls the money supply, and no, they're, they're not the U.S. government. And no, not even the congressman, not even the president can look at that, their balance sheet. No. Hmm. Well, why would he? <laughs> they're not part of the U.S. government. They just control the money supply. Um, they also point out he would try to abolish the IRS, but uh, depending on your, your views, there's a constitutional amendment that allows the collection of federal income tax. Some people dispute whether that's legitimate or not, but you know there are some hurdles here. You'd probably need Congress on board. The president can't just change some of these things. Um, 
And they point out that without an income tax, if we were successful in that, uh, the income tax is really a good tool for the, uh, in tandem with the Federal Reserve, to try to control inflation. Basically, by taxing money out of the economy, you can always raise, raise the, infra, uh, the tax rates to try to control monetary expansion. They really wouldn't have that tool anymore. So the Fed would probably have to adopt a more even-handed approach. They couldn't just dump a whole bunch of money into the economy and try to suck it back through taxes. They'd still have the interest rate tool and things like that. Yeah. But if the Fed were still around, or you know, the Treasury Department, the central bank, they wouldn't just be able to suck money back out of the economy after they dump it on the market. And we've talked a lot about how inflation is not good for the working class, not good for the middle class. I think a lot of people are starting to realize that now. But uh, they, they point out a few more things. It's, it's a long list, uh, but dramatically different things than anything that Herman Cain or Mitt Romney or Barack Obama are proposing. He's actually talking about real change. A lot of people call that radical. I would argue that clearly what we've been doing hasn't been working out so well. So I don't know why you would just want to tinker in the margins of a system that you know is clearly broken at a deeper level. Some people still don't realize that, but we clearly have a broken system, yet you're still crazy for saying, well, we need to make serious structural changes to it. Change is scary, I get that, but uh, at least there's a precedent for having a constitutionally sized government. We did it for a long time and it seemed to work out pretty well. So it's, uh, this I, is, I like that as a solution yeah. better than some of these other proposals that this are playing is, out there, like 999. I don't this know is what the, the craziness of it. It's like a, you're headed for a cliff in a car. And someone says, we're headed for a cliff. We're going to go over. And you say, jam on the brakes. And they go, no, that would be crazy. Craziness to do something like that. Let's keep going. Maybe we'll move to the left a little bit. That'll still send us over that cliff. But we be too crazy to hit the brakes and turn around. Anyways, we do need to move on. We promised a couple other things we have to get to here. I want to stay right here in New Hampshire where there's some good news coming out. It's not often times that we get to talk about good things, but... Not often enough. No. Now we do. This is coming from Ware, New Hampshire, where a district court judge in Goffstown, New Hampshire, has dismissed a criminal charge against a Ware man for recording his conversation with a police officer during a traffic stop. Judge Edward Tenney followed a recent First Circuit Court of Appeals decision in Boston, Massachusetts, in Glick versus, what is it, Cuniff? Cuniff? Anyways. I thought it was Cuniff, but I Cuniff. Don't know. In a ruling that William Alman was within his constitutional rights when he made an audio recording of a Ware police officer during a traffic stop in July of 2010. The recording was made via cell phone when Alman called Porcupine 911, an answering service for a libertarian activists. Um, as the officer approached his car, the judge, um, I'm sorry, though the charge was not filed until the following February, Alman's attorney, Seth Hippel, told the new, the new American on Thursday that the officer was aware at the time that he was being recorded and told Alman that it was illegal for him to record him without his permission. Alman insisted that he had the right to do so, and Judge Tenney agreed, citing the First Circuit's ruling in the Glick case. Glick leaves no doubt that engaging in audio recording of police officers in the course of his official duties in a public place is protected uh, speech under the First Amendment, Tenney wrote. The judge also found that Alman had in no way interfered with the officer in the performance of his duties. The Alman case was one of three in the past 18 month in months in which Ware police have charged citizens with unlawfully recording police officers in public. Charges were dropped against the other two, but one of them, who is also represented by Hippel, is now suing the town and its police department over her arrest. The place, plaintiff is seeking compensation for time spent in jail following the arrest, time lost in court, and lawyer fees, as well as emotional distress. So will the individual's police officers have to pay this out if she is successful? No. The taxpayer as well. No, yeah, where we'll have to do it. I hope that what the Ware Police Department has learned its lesson this time around, though. Right. Well, I, I, think, I think lawsuits have a, have a good way of driving that. Well, out. you would have thought. I mean, it's the third one. Police chiefs usually get fired if they get sued more than once. Well, we'll see. I mean, they, in 18 months, they've arrested three people for recording them. Yeah. Well, I think they're going to get beaten up pretty hard for that now. And, they, you know, Monterey. some of these arrests were taking place before the Glick ruling. So, I mean, we reported on that, that court case. A great step forward. Really, uh, you know, we've been talking about the freedom to record police in public when they're discharging their duties for a long time. No longer do you really have to worry, at least in New Hampshire, at least in the First Circuit, about 
being arrested and facing seven years in prison on a felony charge for recording somebody who's supposed to be a public official in public doing the people's business. I don't know how that was ever considered spying or wiretapping, uh, but it's not just a New Hampshire thing that's on the books all over the place. And unfortunately for a lot of you, you fall outside of the jurisdiction of the First Circuit Court. So uh, that ruling, the Glick ruling doesn't necessarily give you anything to go on unless you want to get your circuit to make a ruling. And that's a long, expensive, uh, tedious fight. So, that you might lose and just go to jail least, for many years. At least years here in New Hampshire, hard. we don't have to worry about being arrested for filming police. And most of them were pretty good about it, but then you have certain departments and certain individuals where it has a reputation yeah. for making these arrests. A so, lot of good police officers uh, appreciate an extra camera. Yeah, I don't there. think we've ever had an arrest for filming police officers here in Keene. No, only if they try to go into the courtrooms. The judges here have That's, decided, actually, all over whole New other Hampshire. Thing, yeah. But I will say the Keene Police Department when they're on the sidewalk or on the street, they've been yeah. very good about being filmed, even if, you know, Fair enough. the people doing the filming aren't particularly friendly towards them. So. That is true. All right, Nick, we don't have much time. I hope to have more time for your ranting and raving. I don't know if you're going to have enough time to no, get even, amped up and red in the face even. I don't know if I have enough time. Maybe we'll talk about it next week. Or on, on the, the radio, radio show. show. But That's the, two hours of just Nick ranting every week because I, I do. work, my I work hours have changed. So Nick is now There's by himself every Sunday. There's a lot of stuff up here that I have to get out before it causes some kind of a stroke. Yeah. So that's what we do here and on the radio show. I, my point was going to be about how people, these Occupy Wall Street protesters and a lot of other people are clamoring for the government to bail them out. Whenever you ask for free money from the government, it seems to make those things you're asking them to pay for more expensive. And the three points I was going to make was healthcare. Government's been involved in healthcare for a long time. Where have prices gone? The housing market. Let's just say that if it wasn't for the government, there wouldn't be such a thing as a 30-year note. And people say that's a bad thing because people couldn't afford housing. I was going to make this whole point about, yeah, people couldn't afford housing for a year or two, but then the housing market would collapse, meaning prices would come back down to a reasonable, uninflated, unsubsidized level. It was going to be this really good rant. Well, we'll have I think to it makes a lot of sense. Tune into we'll the radio show. It. And then you can call in, and if you disagree with some of those points that he just made, I was you can get call in and talk too. to him about it. Or at least I was going to feign being mad. Yeah. So, so you can listen to that. It is. Um, it does make me mad. What is it? Uh, well, you're live on the three air. Three to five. Three Eastern to five. Time. Eastern time on radio. Sundays. Call, tune in, call in, listen to Nick get all angry about this subject, hopefully. Right the show. All right. Well, we're out of time for this week. Freemindstv.com, freemindstv.org. However you want to get to our website, all the archives are there, ways to contact the show, the radio show, our show notes, so much more. Um, thank you very much for tuning in and join Nick on the radio and join us next week for an all new episode. Thanks a lot and have an excellent evening or daytime whenever you're watching.